it was very much about creating this uh, very aspirational way of being, which is feeling really sure of yourself, really anchored to your your sense of who you are in the world and what you stand for. And in very simple terms, not being a flake, not being someone who doesn't care about things. And by not caring about things, I mean everything from um, caring about turning up on time for a meeting with a friend to caring about making your bed every morning to caring about setting the table for a meal, even if you're on your own. So Mm -hmm. the woman that I'm writing about is this woman that I've always really wanted to be, which is this very confident, self-assured, charming, funny, interesting person who just exudes calm and joy in the world. Hello and welcome back to Raise the Bar, formerly known and loved as Women on Top, the weekly podcast that explores business work and money through honest conversations with women on a mission, brought to you by me, Frankie Cotton. And what a pleasure it is to be back behind the microphone. My guest this week is author and former acting editor-in-chief at Elle, Lottie Jeffs. Lottie published her book, How to Be a Gentlewoman, The Art of Soft Power in Hard Times, a few months before the pandemic. And during our conversation, Lottie reflects on how the key themes in the part memoir, part manual, have stood the test of time and enormous change in our circumstances. In this episode, we talk about the importance of empathetic leadership, but also how to differentiate it from emotional labour. Lottie tells us how she became more conscious of the type of leader she wanted to be, with a real focus on communication and compassion in the workplace. We talk about how structure and routine is getting us through this third UK lockdown, how to give yourself a boost and create boundaries with our working lives. And finally, Lottie tells us her approach to managing conflict online, sharing a story that exemplifies soft power in the face of misogyny. This conversation was recorded on the 1st of February 2021. I hope you enjoy listening. If you've got a view on anything mentioned in the podcast and would like to share it, you can send an email to podcast at raise the dot bar, or you can join in the conversation online using the hashtag raise the bar and tagging us at raise HQ underscore on social media. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast series, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps us to be more visible, which ultimately means we can bring you more interviews with brilliant women. Thank you. Calling all businesses looking to scale up, grow, diversify and innovate, the British Library's Innovating for Growth programme is here to help. By joining Innovating for Growth, you can access £10,000 worth of expert advice and guidance for free, thanks to funding from the European Regional Development Fund. The programme provides free, tailored workshops and bespoke one-to-one advice sessions, all of which now take place online, with business experts on everything from marketing and branding to finance and product development. Applications are open until the 3rd of March 2021. Find out more at bl.uk forward slash grow. Thank you very much to the British Library. Lottie, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So today is the 1st of February 2021. Um, wondering how we got here, really. How are you doing and feeling right now? I am feeling remarkably good today. I think we all have good days and bad days, don't we? I mean, it sounds like such a cliche, but genuinely some days I feel like I'm in the pits of despair and other days I feel like oh actually I can do this this is quite good you know life is smaller life is more manageable I'm sleeping more you know I'm enjoying the work I'm doing at the moment my daughter's bringing me a lot of joy like it feels like okay today's today's a good day so I'll just I'll just take that and no doubt Tomorrow will be different, but hopefully good as well. <laughs> yeah, just try and ride those waves as they come. Exactly, yeah. Absolutely. Well, Lottie, I'd love to start by asking you about your book, How to Be a Gentlewoman, The Art of Soft Power in Hard Times, which was published in September 2019, which feels like a whole different sort of universal way. Um, and I wonder, can you tell us the essence of the book for anyone listening to this who perhaps hasn't read it? Yeah, sure. So... I coined this term gentlewoman, which I mean, I didn't coin the term personally. I 
I, I suppose, appropriated the term. Um, but I, I wonder if it's kind of confused some people, because I think it's quite key that I'm not saying that you're a gentle woman. I think that it's the compound of the word gentlewoman that becomes then equivalent to a gentleman. Um, although gentleness as a concept has also seeped into my thinking as I was writing the book, it was very much about creating this uh, very aspirational way of being, which is feeling really sure of yourself, really anchored to your your sense of who you are in the world and what you stand for. And in very simple terms, not being a flake, not being someone who doesn't care about things. And by not caring about things, I mean everything from um, caring about turning up on time for a meeting with a friend, to caring about making your bed every morning, to caring about setting the table for a meal, even if you're on your own. So mm -hmm. the woman that I'm writing about is this woman that I've always really wanted to be, which is this very confident, self-assured, charming, funny, interesting person who just exudes calm and joy in the world. So the book itself, um, actually the origin of the book is I wrote a, a funny listicle for Elle magazine when I was first there and um, it was the 29 things that make you a gentlewoman and it was everything from knows how to play gin rummy to um, can swim three different swimming strokes to um, I can't remember them now but it was like all the things that you kind of if you met a woman that could do all of this stuff you'd be like oh, she's cool she's crazy. She, <laughs> she's got it yeah you know sends handwritten cards has her own personalized stationery um, you know, I'm still taking these things off this list. Like by no means am I saying <laughs> I am this person, but it's an aspiration, as I said. Um, so the book itself is a mix of memoir, which is my own journey of becoming, I suppose. Um, and it starts from, I suppose, my lowest point to building myself back up again and discovering what I was about and getting to know and like myself, I think that's a key thing that I talk about in the book is, is really liking yourself. And I think a, a lot of people really struggle with that. It sounds like quite a simple thing. Like, of course you like yourself. Who else is there? If you don't like yourself, you mm. know, what's left. But actually, I think if you really interrogated it, a lot of women in particular don't really enjoy their own company um, and are probably seeking to escape themselves and their internal monologues a lot of the time. So much of what I do in the book is trying to foster this okayness with just being with yourself. So even simple things like when we could uh, going out for dinner on your own, or mm. even now, you know, just choosing to go for a walk on your own and just being on your own in your own company um, and being at peace with that, I think is a really important thing because it's from that, that the healthy, healthiest relationships with other people built so so I believe it's only really when you're you're most secure in yourself that you can really have good and healthy relationships with other people friends family and partners of course but as you say I wrote that book in a very different time <laughs> where things felt very different of course although I would say that it's probably quite relevant for our pandemic times because there's a whole chapter on home and being at home yeah. which is about the importance of your ambience and the space that you create for yourself. Um, and I think that this idea of being on our own is something that is very much um, prevalent at the moment. Well, that's what I was going to say to you, Lottie, because, you know, you're talking there about actually sometimes how how women can find it really hard to sit and listen to this internal monologue. And that's part of it, right? When you first start to spend time alone and really sort of examining what's what's happening is having that time to, to really process what's going on. And, and that can be quite painful. And I imagine a lot of people during the pandemic, if they haven't necessarily done that yet, you know, living the sort of busyness, the hamster wheel type existence that many of us did, is that it's a bit of a shock to the system. All of a sudden being at home so much, potentially alone a lot, and actually confronting some of these big topics about, you know, really how it feels to be the kind of, and show up as the kind of person that you want to be 
And as you were saying just now, you know, um, the the woman, the gentlewoman in the book is who you wanted to be. She was absolutely who I want to be as well. <laughs> it was, I was I actually listened to it on audiobook and I was listening to it and I was thinking, gosh, yeah, this really is a sort of manual and a blueprint for some of the things that if I stop and think about it, I know they're really important, but we just get so wrapped up in the sort of expectations I think of others and maybe this is just I don't think it is just me personally but this feels like a personal experience getting wrapped up in in other people's expectations but Lottie my question to you is it it feels like this book is about two things at its core for me one is consciousness and this awareness and the other is self-worth which you've talked about before really liking yourself and I wonder how you cultivated those in your own life what that process was for you to sort of come to terms with those two things yes thank you that's a really um nice reading of the book and I'm really pleased that they're the two things that you took from it consciousness and self-assuredness what's interesting I think is that we get to these places without really realizing that we've got there. It's not like, you know, your description of what we're, what we're all going through right now is of, of having come off the hamster wheel and suddenly being confronted with ourselves and, and forced to sort of reflect. I don't think any of us, we don't sit there with like a notebook and be like, I'm going to reflect on myself now, or I'm going to, you know, face up to the person I've been and change. It's so nebulous how that kind of change happens. And so I think for me, it's really only in retrospect and it's really only through piecing together the book that I realized that this is what had happened to me. So I think at the time, I suppose the things I noticed were small things I was doing from not to bang on about it, but making the bed every day to going and sitting in a restaurant and having dinner on my own. And then at the time I'm just doing the thing. I'm not thinking about it in a, in a wider Mm. context. And it was only really when I pieced together the small things that I realized they added up to a whole. So I think that the self-assuredness came really for me from the people I was surrounding myself with really helped. And I think once I got out of a bad relationship, which had done nothing but really diminish my sense of self, I was really able to grow into the person that I wanted to be and to see that person reflected back to me by the people that I surrounded myself with. Um, And also I just started really enjoying my work and finding a lot of confidence from feeling like I'd found my flow in what I was doing work-wise. So I think that that was probably it for me. It's interesting how you talk about the the small habits, you know, like making your bed and all of these things. And I think that in times like we're in now, it's really easy to forget some of those things. You know, when your whole habit, all your habits have changed and all your points of reference have changed. It's those things become the, these anchors, right? And they give you that sense of structure and 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 they do contribute to that sense sense of self-worth and I know that when I have well, you're talking earlier about the days and the waves and the ups and the downs the days where you have the downs I look back sometimes and think well you know I didn't go for a walk this morning or I haven't had any fresh air or anything okay that's why I've forgotten yeah, exactly. all the basics and yeah and I found as well and I don't know if this is maybe not a good thing because maybe it's too controlling but I find that the days that I feel most unsettled or like negative are the days when what I've planned to do hasn't gone to plan like that's I really don't like that I'm very much someone that's like right tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go for a walk and then I'm going to get a coffee and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to come home and if I if something happens like if the weather isn't good and I can't do that it really takes a lot for me to get over that and be like okay I'm okay with this change of plan it really throws me and I think that one of the the sort of dangers of being a gentlewoman, of being somebody that really cares about things and plans things and sets goals for themselves and wants to achieve things in the day is that it can get a bit rigid. You know, I wish I could be a bit more relaxed into the sense that, you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen and just you've got to change and go with the flow. But I feel like I do cling on quite tightly to my routines and my rituals because I feel like they're the things that they keep me together. And so I don't like to feel that they're unravelling. And Lottie, that's really interesting. And I wonder if, you know, in the book, and I know that you've you've had sort of various phases 
at L and then you went to the creative agencies and then I think have you spent some time working freelance as well yes I have yeah and I wonder how that sense that you have about and and I'll use the word control just because you used it (laughs) I don't want to put that word on you but having that sort of routine and and all of those things how did how did you deal with freelance life how did that affect sort of having a complete career change and managing your time differently and different expectations I think I really tried to put the same structure on my days when I was freelance um made lots of lists of things I wanted to do in the day and because the way my wife and I work out our week so this might be interesting to listeners actually um so my wife is freelance as well she's a freelance um, she has a travel trends forecasting agency called globe trender and she works for herself um so before when I was freelance and she was freelance we would work alternate days three days a week and we would do childcare three days a week and then we would have one day together as a family um and that really worked well for us because it meant that we could really have a clear division between work and home life um and on the days that we were working you know we wouldn't get sucked into doing housework or helping with the the baby we'd really sort of stick to stick to the the routine so i suppose i survived freelance by being like that Uh, Also, interestingly, at the beginning of this year, I had this period of time of like two or three weeks between just not having any freelance work and starting again a maternity cover job at L. Though I knew I had something lined up, so I wasn't really worrying that much about work. And um, it was really good for me because I just said to myself, I'm just going to use this time to relax. And because I'd said it and I'd planned to do it, it was almost like, okay, that's that's what I'm doing. Whereas normally if I'd felt at all, like I hadn't decided that I was going to relax. If I felt like I was just like, I wasn't working. I didn't know what I was doing. Then I'd have found that really difficult, but I was like, okay, the things I'm going to do are read more books, learn Japanese on Duolingo, play my Xbox and look after my daughter. And they're all the things I did. And I, I loved it because I suppose I was still had like a few things that I was sort of aspiring to do every day. But I just really kind of gave myself up. And it's the first time I think I've ever really done that. And it was it was really nice. It felt good. It felt healthy. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. I, I like what you said there as well about surviving freelance. I'm not sure if you're, if you're aware that's the word you use. Yeah. I think it says a lot about how many of us feel when we start a business or go freelance. Yeah, I mean, there's so many great things about working for yourself and being freelance. And I did love it I loved it compared to office jobs I've had that I haven't loved but now I'm doing an office job that I love I realize that I like it more than freelance if that makes sense yeah it 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 totally makes sense about the nature of the work and what you enjoy doing Mm. I think as well it, it can be you know very lonely when you're working you know in isolation um well, both in literally physically in isolation as we are at the moment, you know, and 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 probably that's quite tough. Is is that compounding of you know being being freelance during a pandemic and then not having the social element, which usually can help us all prop up how we feel about our work as well. If we yeah, are free, totally, it all starts feeling very abstract. You're like, what am I even doing? Literally, yeah. what am I doing? Especially when you're not work when you don't say as a freelance writer you have a day where you don't have an immediate deadline and really the things you should be doing are like reading other newspapers and magazines, researching ideas, emailing people, making contacts, thinking, just sitting down and thinking. Like when you're doing that kind of work, then you just feel like, well, this is just a pretend job. I'm just making this whole (laughs) thing up. It doesn't exist. What am I doing? Who am I? And then everything starts falling apart. Um, But, you know, that kind of work is just as important as a creative person as the actual, okay, I'm writing an article because I'm on a deadline. Mm. So I think that's something I really, if I go back to freelance, would like to do more of is just say scheduling that time for like, it's okay to just have a day where I'm just thinking and writing and reading and engaging with culture. That's Mm. okay. I don't need to be like trying to like thinking of my time as money all the time. Mm -hmm. I can definitely relate to that. And Lottie, something that I want to to dive into with you is that 
my my understanding and interpretation of soft power as you cover it in the book is really fostering compassion and empathy and leadership which is something that you know I wholeheartedly back and I stand with you on that I think it's, it's very important but also on the flip side I have a sense that there could potentially be an unfair expectation particularly of women to be empathetic and and I've certainly seen that play out in in workplaces and and I felt it myself when when I've been leading teams is that there is this expectation already for you to have a certain level of compassion and empathy and and I wonder if if you see that do you do you think that that exists or how do you think we can you know sort of navigate those expectations but also show up authentically and and compassionately as you suggest I suppose it comes down to what we mean by empathy and compassion, because I think if what we mean is as a woman, we expect you to do the emotional labor of going and comforting someone in the toilet if they're crying because they broke up with their boyfriend or um, being the one that goes and buys the birthday muffins because it's something you've remembered it's somebody's birthday or that makes the tea for everyone or, you know, does that kind of emotional labor, then I think I would not want to put those kind of expectations on women. And I would find that annoying if I felt that people had those expectations of me. Mm. But if, if what we mean by empathy and compassion is just humanness and uh, respect for other people and a sense that people are people and not just workers and they have lives and interior lives and real lives that exist beyond the workplace and maybe they've got stuff going on i think that we should expect not just women but we should expect everyone to exhibit those characteristics and not sort of gender them to be things that are only expected of women or assumed of women but are things that are really assumed of everyone because i i just i i understand that there are some people who maybe identify as less empathetic and compassionate and perhaps more direct or hard-hitting but I think those people should still be kind. And that's what it comes down to. And I don't really think there's any excuse for, I, th- I think maybe some leaders, male and female, hide behind their type of like, I'm not an empathetic leader, I'm a radical mm. candor leader or whatever. But actually it's just basic human kindness and everybody should be that kind of person. And I think that if you're not, I mean, you're just a bit of a, not very nice person really like if you're like well I don't do empathy I mean what do do you even what do you like what could that mean yeah no I agree with you and I think and I think that the and it's not even necessarily an issue but I guess the the point to discuss is as you say what's what's your understanding or interpretation of what empathy actually means you know and 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 just treating people like human beings is is absolutely you know with that respect and that kindness is absolutely essential as you say I guess that there are just some workplaces that that we that I'm sure we've all experienced where where that can be and I don't like to use the word weaponized but it can, it can be weaponized I think particularly against women so just something to to sort of look out for very interesting um I've never experienced that personally and I would worry that that if that is the case and and I'm sure it is if, if people have experienced it that it would make you go the other way if you felt like or oh, people just expect me to be this like really sort of overly maternal empathetic person at work I don't identify with that personality and and I'm rejecting it and therefore I'm going like completely the other way that maybe people feel that they end up having to sort of create this armor for themselves that makes them come across as like steely and no nonsense and um, not indulge anything more feelings oriented and I think that that's a real shame because I wouldn't I would believe that those people are still good people and with their family and friends they're they're able to exhibit empathy but they just don't know quite how to be that person at work yeah and I think what I love Flotty about about the gentlewoman is that it all begins I think with with the with the inward or to the sort of doing it to the self the sort of compassion for yourself and also the accountability and all of these things sort of combine it's not just saying okay I'm going to be totally compassionate towards you and actually I'm going to put other people's 
feelings or expectations above my own I think it very much starts inwardly and it's about that that sort of having the that sense of self we were talking about earlier and that is just as important that's I guess a way that you can avoid that trap is of if, if somebody's sort of asking you to be overly compassionate or to deliver that emotional labor but it's at a cost to yourself I guess that's you know the essence of what you're talking about as a gentlewoman absolutely yeah I think you put that really well and I think if you think about all the people you've maybe worked with or even people from school who have just been like the worst, like nightmare (laughs) bosses, difficult, like tricky, um, insincere, just difficult people. And I definitely don't just mean women by this. I mean, people, um, those people, probably that behavior comes from deep insecurity and a, a deep, really dislike of themselves I think that that's where it all stems from. So in a way, that's something that has helped me deal with difficult people in the past is thinking, what happened? What's wrong? Like, mm. where did this come from? Who made you feel like this about yourself, that you're, you're not a stronger person in yourself and that it's manifesting in this like weird behavior? So I think if you're working with someone who is really difficult, it's, it can help to try and understand why and where it's coming from in them like maybe they're going through like a hideous time at home maybe their partner is horrible to them maybe they come from a difficult home you know god knows what but those kind of things really do add up to a person so i think at work it's just useful to remember that people are people and not just bosses or managers or whatever Mm. and I guess you know this comes back to that that pillar that we were talking about earlier is having the consciousness to catch that before you internalize it so having that space to sort of think okay before I take this on you know this this behavior or this sort of toxicity that is affecting me before I take that on and go well what's wrong with me and why can't I deliver or why you know it's, it's saying okay let's create some space here and let's figure it out and actually that it's not necessarily on me consciousness absolutely and just not responding in the heat of a moment you know really thinking about it not thinking that everything is always about you I think we will often believe that we're the protagonists of our own, <laughs> of our narratives and you can often feel especially at work that everyone's out to get you you're having a harder time than everyone else you know and the the truth is nobody's thinking about you the way you're thinking about yourself really because everyone yeah. else is just thinking Thank about themselves about them. <laughs> so I think that that is a really useful thing to do and it comes back to what I was saying earlier of there not being necessarily that that breakthrough moment where you're like I'm going to sit and do some self-discovery now but actually in those instances that is something where you can think just stop, take a breath and think, what is this situation really about? How am I going to react? If I say that, what's that going to make that other person feel? And then what am I going to, you know, just like see things through a bit more before acting in the heat of a moment and just really thinking. Absolutely. And on that note, one of my favourite parts of the book was when you talk about how you deal with an advertising exec who belittles <laughs> your appointment at a creative agency. Obviously, it's not brilliant for that reason. What's brilliant is the way that you respond. And this links to what you're just saying is is, is taking that space and thinking about how you want to respond. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps tell us a bit about that moment and how, from your perspective, we can avoid this sort of race to the bottom on social media that we sometimes find ourselves in where we just sort of get stuck in and pile in on things that frustrate us so I discovered I think about six or seven months into my tenure at Ogilvy as a creative director which is a job that I went to from Elle magazine being the acting editor-in-chief of Elle magazine um I discovered that this guy who I won't name because I haven't named him thus far, but um, if you're interested, message me and I'll tell you. (laughs) Um, He's a sort of old advertising legend guru type guy. And he had taken umbrage with something that I'd written for the evening standard because the press were quite interested in my appointment to Ogilvy because I had gone from journalism and magazine editing into advertising and I had given the job title of creative director but I had been told to be a different kind of creative director and do something very different with the role and bring my skills as a journalist to the role um, and mix it up and change things and all of that kind of stuff um, so I'd written a piece for the evening standard about about this and about sort of um, 
the joy of not knowing what you're doing you know not not in a self-deprecating sense but in like I genuinely don't know how to be an advertising creative director because that's not what I've been trained in Mm -hmm. I know how to do something else and I'm coming here to bring that something else and like the freedom of that and of not being constrained by what creative directors should or shouldn't do yeah so I write this piece and then um it comes to my attention that this guy has tweeted this legendary advertising guru has sort of tweeted about it saying how ridiculous it, it is that I got the job I can't even remember now it's been a while um what it was he actually said but um he was very like demeaning of me and oh that was it it was um saying something like oh she's probably just been brought in for to to think of like fluffy content ideas and then the meanest thing he said was I bet her mum has her ideas pinned up on the fridge with little fridge magnets and what What does that even mean that's ridiculous my mother is incredibly chic and it's not somebody that would even dream of having fridge magnets um so that was the first (laughs) thing and then I just thought you absolute arsehole and like the thing about this guy is he's actually written books about like being the change agent doing things differently being a rebel but of course when it's a woman coming into a position of power he really couldn't handle it and then it turned into this whole thing that I was taking jobs from people and by people I I would read men um, who had families to provide for and had worked their whole career to have this job meanwhile I my wife had actually just um given birth and I was indeed providing for my family so on so many levels it was just like so offensive and I really could have gone to town on him because um partly because of my connections in the media like I could have written articles Mm. about it I think I probably did write articles about it but I never mentioned him or I just could have gone in on on Twitter Actually, I really don't use Twitter or or engage with Twitter at all, at all because I just find it like, horrifying. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. And so I got his email and I sent him an email saying, um, interested to read your views on uh, social media, particularly those regarding my mother and her fridge. Perhaps <laughs> you'd like to meet up for a coffee and we can discuss your issues with me in person. And then he got back to me and he sent me like the definition of a mansplaining email where he didn't engage with my um, invitation at all. He just like wrote a whole essay again about the sort of taking the jobs from other people, the industry, blah, blah, blah. And then I just got back to that saying, so how about that coffee then? And he just ignored me. So I feel like I handled that well because I was very tempted and I think I probably did write a few tweets that I could have sent back. Um, You know, I could have screen grabbed it and put it on social media and it could have been a big thing and I could have had him cancelled, I'm pretty sure. But I didn't and I think I handled it in a good way and I felt like I'd come out of the situation the better person and I feel like if it had gone on Twitter, I would not come out of it feeling like the better person I would have felt like I just Mm. met him on his terms rather than create my own terms and you know people so rarely admit they're wrong do they especially on Twitter like there's no way this guy (laughs) would be like oh yeah no great thanks so much for bringing that to my attention I really feel like that's wrong (laughs) yeah absolutely all the best you know kind regards there's no way he would have ever said that Um, he would have just doubled down on what he was saying and it would have just turned horrible. So I think particularly in our hyper-polarised society, just thinking before you get involved in stuff is really a good piece of advice because it takes something from you when you put Mm -hmm. yourself out there like that. It really does. And so you've got to be prepared. Okay, if I'm going to enter into this fight, what do I stand to lose? And not just in terms of like, reputation and that sort of thing but in terms of the time I'm putting into this the emotional effort the energy uh what else could I be doing with that time you know so I just think again just taking stock and really thinking about things some fights are worth fighting I'm not saying be a pushover um but just you know I feel like I fought that fight I don't feel like I um yeah I agree with you I rolled over I just did it in what I hope is a classy way yeah, yeah, it was classy and it was smart. And I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. You definitely did did fight that fight. 
And I wonder in terms of sort of online communication and obviously this this being a prime example of that, we're all living in a world of online communication and I don't know about you, but sometimes it drives me completely potty and I feel like, as we were just saying about Twitter, it feels like an angry space. <laughs> Every time I go on there, I'm a bit sort of flustered when I come off. But I know that one of your guidelines for being online that you wrote about back in 2019 was avoiding conference calls. And that's something that is now, we, we're doing it all the time. And I just wonder, um, in terms of how you've navigated online communication, because I, th- I think a lot of what you talk about, which I love, is face-to-face. You say, don't send an email if you can go over and speak to somebody. You know, it's about returning to human connection, which I really value. But how have you captured the essence of that and how you feel about those things? <laughs> I think so. For example, um, I started a new job last week. Well, I went back to L, so it's like a new, it's a new team, but a familiar job. And what I did was try and make contact individually with people and set up a bit of a rapport with them. So um, have just like a one-on-one, face-to-face meeting, which was just more of a chat and like getting to know each other, before then going into like a forum meeting scenario where people are maybe more nervous or don't want to talk and asking if people need want it to be face uh, facetime you know like actually i think just a voice call is perfectly adequate um sometimes and and maybe it's just easier on the other person because maybe Mm. they're a parent and are doing something else at the same time and so just being conscious of other people's home scenarios and I guess just accepting it like there's no other choice really I'd rather do a conference call than not speak to anyone all day so I've had to just sort of embrace it have been getting dressed up every day which was quite funny like on my first day at L they were like oh we can tell it's your first day because you're (laughs) tailoring I was like well what do you mean I'm going to be wearing this every single day of course um but they're right you know of course quickly but there is something about getting dressed for work, even if you are at home, that feels important to me. And I think had I written the book in, during the pandemic, I would have been talking about still making the effort, still, you know, doing your makeup and your hair and putting your mm. nice clothes on just to sort of mark the beginning of the day. Because then taking it off at the end of the day and putting your comfy clothes on is like a nice reminder that it's the end book of the day. ends now. the day, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And Lottie, I wonder... Is there anything that you sort of hope or perhaps expect that the world will look like when it opens up again? Are there any of the good, the good things that we're sort of going to take away from this and any of the things that you really hope return from, from our previous life? I think we will probably all be a bit kinder and more generous to each other. Um, because I do believe that having this insight into each other's bedrooms, literally, has, I know. Um, I'm just has thinking really, that we've sat here now we've not met before yeah. we could already see you know, it's, but yeah. I think that it's it's really created an honesty and a rawness about what it is to be a person and to have empathy and to understand the different situations that everybody is existing within um, and to see home and work not as distinct things but as all part of the same thing and to kind of respect boundaries within that, but also change our expectations of what somebody needs to be at work. So, you know, to lose that sense of panic, like for example, today I had an appointment and I also had a really important meeting that I wanted to be in. And I felt that sort of panic of like having to rush back for the meeting and what will people think of me if I'm not in the meeting or if I'm late. And, and then I was like, actually, it's okay. I can still do my job and do everything I need to do and get my work done today. And someone will tell me what happened in the meeting. And if I miss it, it's absolutely fine. And, and sort of alleviating that paranoia of being clock watching, I suppose, of, mm. of work or like clocking in at the beginning of the day and clocking out and just accepting that every, everybody mainly is conscientious and wants to do a good job and you'll get it done people will get it done in their own time or in their own way and as long as they're getting it done and however they do it or wherever they do it is is absolutely fine so hopefully there'll be much more uh support for remote working for you know working abroad um for allowing real life to seep into the edges mm-hmm. of work work mm-hmm. life in a way that just feels much more sustainable and i do hope we'll just be a bit kinder to each other because we've all been through the same trauma 
and it's been yeah i think it's been traumatic for everyone in very different ways um and some people have come out of it a lot easier um than other people particularly people who have lost people um but just to respect that this has been like you know we've all come through we will have all come through a war and yeah. we've been through it together and we've got through it together and i think that that shared trauma will really build hopefully a lot of bridges and be a kind of great leveler i think for years to come what i hope we don't was your question what i hope we don't take as well yeah it was a bit of <laughs> the sort of the good and the bad you know what what are the things that you hope come back and what are the things that you were hoping to change oh man i just hope we can go out and have fun again with friends and like I know. party and go to <laughs> I mean, dress up and go out and have fun and just like be in the moment and hug people and I know. just just the buzz and the atmosphere of people and and exactly. conversation and all of those yeah, things. Totally. I, know. I think there's hopefully okay. Best case scenario, it's going to be like the roaring twenties. We're all going to be fabulously bedecked in all of our lockdown online purchases that we haven't <laughs> worn we'll be like hitting the town um really valuing our friends and our family uh really valuing our leisure time and just having lots of fun and being filled with joy and i that's what i hope for wow and clinging on to that lottie <laughs> it's gonna get us through the next sort of i don't know eight weeks six to eight weeks or so or, or hopefully not too much longer who knows um well lottie thank you so much thanks for chatting to me and for you know for sharing everything you have so generously and of course you know in in writing the book and and your other writing i i just wonder is there anything that we've not touched on that you want to pass on to the listeners while we're here um i think we've covered loads and thank you so much for having me it's been a really really interesting chat and you know it's been a while since i've actually spoken about my book so it's really nice to speak about it again and remind myself that i did write it because sometimes <laughs> this is like oh yeah I did that you know and yeah, tick next yeah thing. <laughs> so it's really nice to go back to it and think about about it and to also think about it in the context of today and how much has changed so thanks for that the only other thing i'd say is i am a co-host of a parenting podcast if anyone's listening who's interested in in that world it's called summer families and it's um, about lgbtq plus parenting so on our new series we're speaking to for example um two mums who were pregnant at the same time and had their baby on the same day what what are the yeah. chances i know we're talking to um who are a couple by the way a married couple two women um a transgender dad we're talking to people who are fighting for equality within ivf same-sex communities um adoption fostering uh surrogacy transracial adoption all that sort of stuff so even if you're straight and it just will give you a really interesting insight into different kinds of families and and talking about emotional labor and how people make mm. things work so do give that a listen if you if you're interested and um my book is available in all good online bookshops well thank you so much lottie i've really thank enjoyed you. chatting i've with really you. loved it i wish we had a glass of wine and Thanks for listening to Raise the Bar. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on your favourite podcast app and spread the word. You can join in the conversation online using the hashtag Raise the Bar and tagging us at RaiseHQ underscore on social media. And you can find all the details about our brilliant guests in the show notes. See you next week. <laughs>